What are you seeking? What are you seeking? So what are you seeking? Peace that passes understanding. Community? Better harmonies, I think. Better harmony all the way around. I'm seeking someone to care for me like Jesus does. reading from the first gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The word of God for the people of God. What are you seeking? That's what we're thinking about throughout this Lenten season. What it means to seek in our own lives, and what we need to be seeking in order to live wholeheartedly, to live in the arms of God. So throughout the Lenten season, we're going to be considering encounters that Jesus has, encounters with various voices who ask questions of him, or sometimes he's the one asking the questions, important, earnest questions of our faith. And this morning, in an encounter that Jesus has in the wilderness, we hear about the importance of listening. What voices are you listening to in your own life? The choice of whom to listen to really does matter, doesn't it? I've listened to the news a lot this week, hearing stories of the difference between what we're listening to in our nation, for example, and in Russia. I I heard one story about a family where some of the folks live in the United States and some of the folks live in Russia and they're in a group chat together and they're kind of silent now in the chat. They're not talking to each other now because it became evident when they were still talking, that they were listening to very different voices, voices that didn't agree at all about what was going on in Ukraine, in the war that is being fought there. The voices of the American, uh, the folks living in the United States, and the voices of those living in Russia were so different. The stories being told, the understanding of the people, so different that they could no longer be in conversation with one another. It it matters what voice you listen to. Voices in our culture can drown us in harsh words and judgments. It matters what voices we listen to in our own lives. 
They can, voices in our culture can say you're not strong enough or smart enough or beautiful enough or important enough. You don't have enough status. You don't have what it takes to be cool or beloved or great or interesting. You just don't have it. You don't have enough friends or a good enough job. You don't measure up. So buy what we have to sell because it's going to make it all better for you. It matters what voice you listen to, doesn't it? One of the voices that's been important in my own life is Brene Brown, someone many of you may have heard about in your daily life. She's a social worker, a researcher, a storyteller who became really big maybe 15, 20, 15 years ago on uh, TED Talks. She gave two TED Talks. One, she was worried she gave it to in front of about 500 people, and she realized it was going online back in the day, and it might be six or 800 people who might hear it in the end. And she was talking about vulnerability in her own life, and she was mortified by it. I said that I am vulnerable. I talked about my vulnerabilities instead of in front of 500 people, and now it's going online. Six, seven, 800 people might hear about it. Six million people heard that TED Talk. Six million people heard her talking about vulnerability and shame in her own life and the power of it and how it should not define her. It should not define us. The voices that would shame us. Sometimes even our own voice of self-shaming. We can be our own worst enemy. And so Brown, a social worker and researcher and storyteller, talks about the research she did into folks who live wholeheartedly, who don't live in shame, who aren't living under that crushing feeling of not being worthy. She interviewed enormous numbers of people and had years worth of research, I think she said six years worth of research, interviewing people, writing their stories, organizing them as research, as data to inform her understanding of vulnerability and shame. She said, you know, I'm a vulnerability and shame researcher. You get on an airplane and someone asks what you do and you say, I study vulnerability and shame and suddenly they get really interested in their magazine. That's her, her field. She, she studied it. And, and she said, I began to, to see coming out of the data that wholehearted people who don't live under the crushing weight of shame, who live into a sense of their own, their own life being theirs, they had something in common. They believed in their own worthiness. That they were worthy of love, worthy of belonging. That's what they had in common. It gave them courage to do bold things in their lives. It, it gave them courage to embrace their own vulnerability and not be ashamed in the midst of it. We, we tend to think that when we're vulnerable, it means we're weak, but she said, no. When you know you can be vulnerable, that's what makes you strong. That's the, the seed of our creativity, our innovation, being in a place of vulnerability, of openness, of realizing that there's more that you need in life. Not that you have it all, that everything's all wrapped up and tied up, but, but that you can be open to more. And so Brown talks about those voices of courage in our world who know their worthiness and don't operate out of fear and shame. Listening to that kind of voice helps me to know who I am more fully, to help me to understand, help all of us to understand 
that we should not live based on fear that we're not enough, but that we should instead look for voices that resonate a deeper, more healing, whole truth in our lives. And so we turn to God in our faith, knowing that God created us out of love. And we listen for voices of faith to inform us. There are so many voices of faith out there, aren't there, today? So many that have influenced us through the years. I've been influenced by voices of faith since I was a young child, sitting at my mother's knee, figuratively speaking. I don't remember ever sitting exactly at her knee, but figuratively speaking. I was taught voices of faith from voices of faith in my Sunday school classes at Carpenter Memorial United Methodist Church when I was a child on Long Island. I was taught as a youth from voices that sought to inform me about my place in the world. Some have been great voices of healing and hope in my life, and sometimes those voices of faith have really troubled me. I remember even in my youth years being really troubled by what I heard coming out of the mouths of some of my youth workers, just voices that didn't resonate, and they didn't stay very long in our youth group. In our, in our world, some of the voices have been great voices of healing and hope, fostering great courage in those who listen, leading our world toward greater healing and wholeness. We think of Mother Teresa. We think of Desmond Tutu speaking boldly about the value of all people and about coming to the right side, to God's side, a side of love and not exclusion as he spoke against apartheid. We think of Martin Luther King Jr., a voice of such strength, a voice of faith and grace and courage and hope in our own nation. Some voices of faith are strong and bold and wholehearted and true. And others are harsh and strident, pushing a theological understanding based on judgment and shame that values some over others. These voices can do such great harm if they're inconsistent with the voice of Christ. And throughout the generations, bad theology has been used to support and uphold slavery, to foster the hatred of other faith communities, particularly Jews, to subjugate women and minorities, to justify the oppression of persons from the LGBTQ plus community, voices of harm if they are inconsistent with the voice of Christ. There are many harsh voices stridently shouting on the religious scene in today's world, competing for airtime. We in the United Methodist Church care a lot about the voices we listen to, and so, Throughout our life of faith, we have thought a lot about what it means to listen to the right voices in the world. And we, like those of the great multitudes of faith communities, so many around us, turn first to Scripture. Scripture as primary in our lives. Scripture as the ground upon which our faith is built, as the... the the gift from God that informs us, the word of God that speaks life into our lives. We turn to scripture as the source of our faith, the ground upon which we build it. But also, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement in the 1700s in England, he grew up in the Church of England, in the Anglican Church, and they talked not just about scripture, but also about tradition and reason. Now, other, other faith communities have said, you read scripture and you take the traditions of the church seriously. But the Anglicans felt it was important also to include reason in that. So the, the tradition informs us, our liturgy the, the way we do worship informs us, the words of prayers we come to know inform us. 
Tradition absolutely informs a scripture and tradition, but reason, our reasoning minds given to us by God. We also read scripture in light of our reasoning, our rational minds to say, how do we interpret the differences we see in scripture? How do we understand what scripture says in today's world written when it was? How does that voice speak in our world afresh today? How do our minds comprehend that? That, that idea of entering reason onto the scene is so important because it means that we can ask questions, hard questions, of our faith. We can seek in the Bible and so often find, but also so often wrestle. Have you ever wrestled with biblical texts? If not, you may not be reading them closely enough. There's a lot of wrestling to do when we get our rational minds at play. And through the generations and generations and generations, we've come to learn more about the science of the world around us, about how the world works, about biology and chemistry and physics. We've seen how humans have interacted throughout history, and we understand the way our mind works more fully. We've learned so much with our rational thinking, and, and that helps us to inform our understanding of scripture as well. People who don't think that the earth is flat, but instead it's part of a great cosmos, and we're not the only planet within it. There are planets everywhere, stars and suns everywhere. We've learned so much. Our rational minds help to inform us as we read scripture. But John Wesley brought another element in that was not from his Anglican heritage. He brought another part in. Scripture and tradition and reason, we use those to inform us. These are voices in our hearts. But he also valued the voice of experience. Those of you who remember about John Wesley will remember that that the big turning point for him when he moved from a rational understanding of God and how he should follow Jesus, when he moved from that to saying, oh, I am claimed by God, I am a, a child of God, I have turned from God and need to turn back, I am beloved, all of that, that moment we refer to as his heartwarming experience, that moment when his life changed, when he came to understand who he was as a child of God. To have assurance that he was claimed by God. And that experience changed his understanding. It changed him for good. And it became so important as he encountered scripture and, and found assurance of the truths of scripture in his own life. It was a way he read into the scripture and read, let scripture read into his life. To let his experience both amplify the scriptures and, and bring the scriptures to life in his mind and also to let his experience understand, help him understand the scriptures. So we in the United Methodist Church talk about these four things that inform us, these four ways we hear the voice of God through scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. We talk about it as sort of a quadrilateral, a funny-shaped one with the long line at the bottom being scripture. That's the big part. And then tradition and reason and experience all forming a quadrilateral together. And that's such a big deal to me. It's one of the reasons I love Methodism, because it means that we can understand Scripture so profoundly in the light of today's world, our understanding in the world today. We can say, this has been my experience of God. This has been my experience of pain and suffering. This has been my experience of life in the world. This has been my experience of grace and healing and wholeness. All these experiences of my life can help me to understand the words of Scripture more fully. 
We in our own congregation have, have heard the voice of experience in our own desire to become a reconciling congregation, one that is assertively welcoming and affirming of the LGBT community in the life and leadership of the church because we have understood the deep pain of persons in our families, in our neighborhoods, around the world, and we have listened to scripture as it relates to that pain and longing for belonging. And so, as Methodists, this understanding of the value of experience is such an important voice for us to listen to. Jesus took great care to listen to the right voice in his own life. Our scripture today is really clear about that. The story tells about Jesus who has just been baptized in the Jordan River. Just the, the couple of verses you read right before our text today. Jesus has been down in the Jordan River being baptized by John. And you may remember the story that as he goes into the water and, and rises from it, there's a dove that descends and the, the clouds part and a voice comes from the clouds, a voice from God saying, this is my beloved in whom I am well pleased. My beloved son, says God. But in today's story, just after that, Jesus has gone into the wilderness. He leaves the baptismal waters, still damp, and heads on into the wilderness. And he encounters the tempter. The words of the tempter come assertively toward Jesus as he spends days and weeks in the wilderness. The tempter's voice rings loud in his ears, saying words that don't really sound all that bad on the surface. You're hungry? Well, turn these stones into bread. He offers Jesus political power and leadership and the ability to perform spectacular signs so people will take him seriously. They're pretty tempting options. Indeed, temptation usually isn't about rejecting something that's obviously bad in order to get something good. Usually it's far more subtle than that. But somehow Jesus is able to cut through all the noise, to hear the hollowness of what the tempter offers. Power and control, dominion, fame, glory, these aren't the things that Jesus needs. They're not what any child of God needs, because we have a power that's different than the, what the world so often seems to value. We have the gift of trust in the God who made us. Jesus could tune out the voice of the tempter because he trusted in God, and he's been listening. He's been listening at his mother's knee or at his father's as he worked alongside him in the carpentry shop. He's been listening in the temple. He's been listening to the traditions of his faith and the stories of his people and God's movement through their lives and his life. He's been listening. Fresh from the waters of his baptism in the Jordan River, Jesus remembers another voice that he's heard. He tunes in to the voice of God, still ringing in his ears even after 40 days in the wilderness, the voice from the cloud at his baptism, this is my beloved, my son, in whom I am well pleased. He hears that voice and it is the source of his strength, his belonging to God, his belovedness. It gives him the courage to turn away from the tempter's hollow deception. He has been listening carefully to the voices of healing and wholeness and ultimately to that voice of God which calls him beloved. Before all else, he is beloved. And we understand that in our own lives. You know, there's all this talk about original sin, about sin going all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden, tempted 
at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Eve taking the apple and taking a bite and passing it to Adam, that, that terrible fall that corrupts us all. And we do understand sin being a part of the fabric of our lives, infusing our lives. But it's not the first part of the story. Because that's a little bit into Genesis. The first part of the story is that we were created out of love by a God who loves us and calls us good. Remember in the, the creation story in Genesis 1, there was morning and evening the first day, God did all this work and called it good. And on the second day, God created more and called it good. And on the third day, good. And fourth day, good. God made a creation that is good. And out of love, God created humankind in God's own image. First of all, we are called good and made in God's image. Made in the image of the God of love. Wow. What a starting point for us. At the deepest inner core of who we are, we are created in, image, in the image of the God of love and made in love. We are beloved to love. And sin has infiltrated our lives, and that's the story for another sermon. Right now, let's go back to the very beginning, to our belovedness. What was it Brene Brown said? Worthiness. Those who live wholehearted lives, she said, the data shows they start from a place of worthiness. Brown is actually a, a practicing Christian. And so I, I think maybe we're on the same page there. That it all starts with our belovedness. What are the voices that ring in your ears? What voices from our culture tell you you're not good enough or smart enough? or beautiful enough, or powerful enough, or strong enough that tell you that you're just too vulnerable, that you're weak, that you're not enough. What are those voices? Are they ringing strong and clear? Well, listen for a deeper voice that goes back to the very beginning of who you are, to the deepest core of your essence. You are beloved. You are known by God, claimed by God. You are worthy of love and belonging in this world. The voice we listen to matters. The world can change because of it. Let's not ring out with the voices of shame and fear in our world, let's silence them, dampen them by that beautiful voice of grace that calls us beloved. Whose voice will you listen to in Jesus' name? Amen.